Greetings. Welcome to the Black Bill. Let's talk about knowledge. How is knowledge possible? To even begin to answer a question like that, why do I even pose myself these questions? Anyway, to even begin to answer a question like that, we'd have to start with a definition of knowledge. And knowledge would be the state of understanding something about the universe that is true. That is, any good definition of knowledge includes the concept of veracity. People know all kinds of things that turn out to be false, and therefore they don't know them, right? You know that your mom is buying you a pony for Christmas, but Christmas Day, no pony. Mm, you didn't know it. You experienced a feeling, the feeling of certainty, mm, but you didn't actually possess certainty, okay? So when we're talking about knowledge, we're also talking about truth. That's for today. Good. That is, because I use this method of knowing to know the thing, it is therefore true. So be really important later. So three eras of knowledge, the pre-modern, modern, and modern ages. In the pre-modern age, uh, superstition and religion really ruled the day. If you wanted to know something you didn't already know, then you had to find the oldest person in your tribe or band or village and ask them and hope that what they told you wasn't just bullshit. Um, as Frank Herbert writes in the Dune novels, uh, when you're lost in the desert, one direction's as good as another, and if nobody knows anything, you might as well try something, and so just Take the advice of the oldest person who it's possible they've seen shit like this before. And that's it. Um, and then we have the then we have the problem of religion as the pre-modern age starts to butt up against the modern age. And people are finding out that a lot of the things the wise people in their villages say, that the priests say, uh, are just crap. Um, there are a lot of burnings and, uh, and hangings and other forms of persecution. So take the case, for example, of Galileo Galilee, who starts to suppose that perhaps the planets don't all go around the earth, but around the sun instead, and he's locked into a tower until he recants his testimony, right? Um, so modernism is a huge threat to pre-modern ways of knowing, and that's why fascists really hate modernism, because modernism proves them wrong. Modernism gives people a reasonable way to make decisions, and no reasonable person would vote for fascists. Okay? Okay. The modern age, mm, over the course of a couple of hundred years, as we started to formalize the way that we think about things, make decisions, uh, referee arguments about the, about the truthfulness of the statements that we're making. Over the course of a couple hundred years, society absolutely revolutionizes. Agriculture booms uh, with a few simple things like better, higher quality food, better hygiene, public works, uh, doctors washing their hands before they assist in a delivery or a surgery, uh, penicillin, right, a few medicines, uh, a couple of innovations in chemistry and physics. Literally millions of lives are saved. Go look up the demographic cliff later. Uh, these are the events that pushed us over it, where we no longer need to give birth to 12 or 11 or 15 children in the hopes that two or three of them will live. Um... Yeah, the modern age, it goes a little far, maybe, with the development of nuclear weapons and not the ethics and moral structure necessary to regulate those kinds of weapons. Like, we're still biophysiologically the same people we were 6,000 years ago, um, and we just don't have the capacity to be wise with such tremendous power. But the modern age. In the modern age, everyone was a logical positivist. They believed that you could make assertions, and if all the assertions were true, then they'd lead you to a conclusion, and that conclusion would be true. And the world was mathematical in nature, so these kinds of assertions were just like math. 
and therefore you could make positive, assertive declarations of truth, right? Logical positivism. TV science shows at the time had names like conquest. Mm -hmm. Good. So massive lifespan and quality of life improvements following from logical positivism. But that age is over. That age is over. We've become so wise at this point, so capable of wisdom at least, that we understand that positive, affirmative truth declarations are really difficult. Um, I hesitate to say impossible because anyone can say anything, but unwarranted, problematic, yeah. Any way that you pick of trying to eliminate all of the variables inevitably leaves some variables in. So we're going to spend some time in future videos, probably. We're going to spend some time analyzing all the ways people would say it's possible to acquire knowledge. We're going to deconstruct those and we're going to use that first standard because I know it this way. It is therefore true. I used my common sense. My common sense is inerrant, and therefore I can make this statement. And it'll be just painfully, radically honest that nobody's common sense is inerrant, right? That's impossible. And so your common sense might be more or less reliable. Spoiler alert, less. Um, but it's not completely reliable. Therefore, because you know it with common sense, you can't say that it's true. I'm just going to break all of the various ways of knowing and just leave us in this state where positive declarations of truth are somewhat out of bounds. Since the early 2000s, probably, science no longer is for making positive, positive truth claims. Science doesn't prove things true. It never did. Science attempts to prove things false and sometimes fails. And when it fails, you get to hold that truth claim as true, but gently and provisionally. And the proviso is that nothing comes along tomorrow that upsets that particular epistemic apple cart. Can you dig it? All right. So loosely, these days we hold the truth loosely. Knowledge isn't really possible. Next thing on our list is the Dunning-Kruger effect. Right there. The U-shaped curve of knowledge. Uh, the U-shaped relationship between competence and confidence. There are three ways to understand this. One, uh, being being dead isn't bad for the dead person. The person who's dead doesn't know that they're dead. They don't have a problem. It's the people they've left behind who suffer. And being stupid is just the same. Right? Stupid people don't know how stupid they are. That's the level zero understanding of the Dunning-Kruger effect. The people who are the least competent experience the most confidence. And... Uh, you know, very proudly don't read books and rely on their common sense and uh, claim that fixing American health care would be so simple, so simple, you just have to put me in charge. Uh, very, very Dunning-Kruger, very Dunning-Kruger. Now, neither Dunning nor Kruger would endorse that explanation. That's why it's level zero. Um, it doesn't even really begin to have truth or, or validity. That's not what they're saying. The level one answer is the more you know, the more you know you don't know, right? So you start studying. You're going to get your degree in epidemiology. Well, first you have to pass basic math, and then you have to pass basic biology. Um, it, seems, it seems to me, if I remember my reading correctly, bio departments are the number one complaint about departments across America. Uh, they're doing some really explicit gatekeeping, um, making the initial classes really, really difficult, somewhat on purpose. 
and students who think they're, you know, they did really well in high school and now they're starting college and they think it's going to be fine, really get a massive culture shock when they show up in their first bio one class. Um, yeah, absolutely inordin inordinately difficult. There's a learning curve on language. Uh, man, it would sure help to know Greek and Latin when you show up and you start reading, reading, reading journal articles to write your papers from and start finding out you're not even qualified to read the entry level biomed journals. Uh, but you have to read like eight or 10 of them to write a paper, uh, it takes you two weeks just to read two or three of them. And you, you want to research a topic, you plug it into the, into the library databases and find there's three or 400 articles on this thing that don't all agree that are on increasingly narrow and, and sort of twee characteristics of the thing you're trying to study. And you're not qualified to read any of them, right? And your confidence suffers. You start to see that there are people who not only have their doctorates and their postdoc work done in these fields that do know so much more than you, but they've been doing this stuff for, uh, in, as individuals, 20 or 30 or 40 years and collectively for a couple of hundred years using what we'd recognize as at least the beginnings of scientific methods and methodology, All right? So that's level one. The more you know, the more you know you don't know. You start to wander off into knowledge and have an existential crisis and see how small you are. You went from being a big fish in a small pond at high school to a small fish in a big pond at college. And that's also not what Dunning and Kruger mean. Although it is on the, on the scale of starting to understand the Dunning-Kruger effect. What they really mean is the more you have real knowledge, skills, and abilities in a field, the more competent you are to judge your own performance. So in the beginning, with no knowledge of the field, you have no basis for judging your own knowledge, skills, or ability in that field. Okay? There you go. And the more you go along, the more you start to see how terrible it was for you to assert any confidence. You look back at the younger version of you, you know, two years ago when you started undergraduate school and go, holy crap, that naive version of me was merely a child who knew nothing, right? Yeah, I think most people can relate to that because at any stage of life we find ourselves in, we tend to look back at the former stages with a certain level of cringe, cringe or embarrassment. How could I have thought I knew anything? And so you have this really steep drop off in confidence because you start to realize you don't have any real competence. The, the beginning stages of competence are recognizing the lack of competence. You know, tear it down so you can build it back up again. And uh, uh, two or three years into a serious biomed program, uh, you start to bottom out and just realize how much knowledge exists and how hard it is to acquire and how untrustworthy ultimately any knowledge turns out to be. And then you can start to climb the other side where you have protocols for making decisions and you're sufficiently well read and, uh, and into the standards and practices, you know, and by year five or six, you're starting to regain some confidence. You never really regain your full level of confidence because your initial confidence was unearned and therefore too high. By the end of an eight-year de degree program, you've started to realize just how much stuff in the world is completely unpredictable and totally unknowable, that some things just actually can't be known or predicted. And there's always extra factors, X factors, things that, 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 that blow up that are totally unexpected. And so... You always maintain a little haze of doubt. Your, your, your endpoint confidence never quite matches your beginning point confidence. In psychology, uh, we call this imposter syndrome, that by the end of graduate school and you're studying for your licensure and you're starting to see clients on your own maybe for the first time um, in your first year out of graduate school, uh, maybe you're teaching and you feel like 
like any day someone's going to discover that you know nothing and you're totally incompetent and you can't do anything and you can't teach anything and you can't help anybody and they're going to just grab you and shake you and 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 kick you out of your job that's a, that's imposter syndrome because that end point confidence is always tentative it's always tentative and conditional good what do we do with this? I used to be a nihilist. You know, the nihilist says all values are baseless. There's no good reason to assert anything is true, much less that anything is right. There's no objective standard for morality. And so I was really, I was really stuck and, and, and despairing and, and looking for a way that could not be, uh, not be 100% the case. Eventually, land in existentialism, which is a, a more of a postmodern, more of a postmodern approach to understanding our clients as well as understanding the world. And you have to outgrow. Um, you have to outgrow logical positivism. The thing is, the politicians these days, particularly the right wing fasci politicians. Um, they're 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 nihilists they will say sometimes outright because nothing can be known any truth claim is as good as any other truth claim um because you can't prove me wrong i can say whatever i want because you can't prove you right then any alternate claim is on equal epistemic footing. And they won't use words like that. They speak at the fourth grade reading level so that your grandma understands. But in postmodern thought, the opposite is true, that this lack of ability to make strongly certain truth claims means we have to be very, very careful what we assert is the truth. So that's it for now. This vid's getting a little long, and I plan on starting another series in this channel, and that series is exactly going to look at the various ways that we would think knowledge would be possible and sort of deconstruct those ways, show you the, the exceptions so that we know that those are not infallible means of knowing. And therefore, because you know it that way, you can't say, therefore, it's true. Good. Okay, bye.